The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Isaac Martin, professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego, where he also teaches in the urban studies and planning program. He's an expert on public policy and social protest and author of a book called Rich People's Movements, Grassroots Campaigns to Untax the One Percent. Professor Isaac Martin, thank you for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you so much for having me. Well, our pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Social movements are usually associated with groups who are trying to grab a piece of the economic pie. What is the meaning of the title of your book, Rich People's Movements, which I should mention is now out in paperback? Well, as you say, when we think of social movements, we usually uh, picture movements of poor people. We might picture people protesting in the streets, picketing, petitioning, committing civil disobedience, and so on. And most of these tactics were actually invented by poor people who couldn't get a hearing any other way. But uh, the big surprise of my research that I wrote about in my book, Rich People's Movements, is that sometimes in American history, people have used these same tactics to demand lower taxes on the rich. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the subject of the book and the real puzzle here is, is why on earth anyone would do that. You know, you make an interesting point that with poor people's movements, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But the surprising thing about rich people's movements is that they even bother. So why do they? This is the surprising thing, because, of course, most of the time, rich people get their way pretty easily in American politics. But it turns out that sometimes they don't. And usually that's in response to a war or an economic crisis. And Congress needs to respond. And even members of Congress who might usually be pretty concerned about their wealthy constituents will decide, well, we need more revenue right now, and, and uh, uh, so we'll raise taxes on, on the richest 1% or what have you. Um, and it's in response to policy changes like that that uh, many rich people feel really threatened, uh, often fear that that's the first step in a, in a broader uh, uh, assault on their property rights. And many other people who aren't quite rich may agree with them or may share their fear. Uh, And it's in moments like that that uh, you find some people starting to organize rich people's movements. In in all this talk about the rich, does anyone agree on what constitutes being rich? Is it the top 1% we've been talking about for the last few years? Well, this is such a funny question that to ask people. You ask people about the rich, and everyone always thinks the rich is somebody, uh, you know, twice as rich as them or, or something like that. Um, uh, so there, there isn't real agreement on what constitutes being rich, and there's certainly no official definition the way that we have an official definition of, of poverty. We have no official definition of being rich. Um, I think the top 1% uh, by income or the top 1% by wealth um, either one of those are not exactly the same people, though there's a lot of overlap. Either one of those is a fine working definition. Uh, in, in the rich people's movements that we've seen in American history, uh, often there are, they're pursuing tax cuts for slightly broader groups than that, say the richest 3% or the you know, richest 5% or what have you. Uh, and, uh, and so these definitions change over time. What they have in common is, is these movements focus on getting some kind of economic benefit for the very richest people in American society, regardless of where exactly you draw that threshold. Now, there is a widely held belief that the rich deserve their status because they have superior superior abilities and they work harder. Is there something to that? You know, I do think that uh, particularly uh, in in America today, 
Um, we know from the research of um, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez that a lot of the rich today are, are what they call the working rich. They're people who, who get rich from salaries rather than from uh, you know, uh, inherited wealth. Um, so work is part of the story. But I think a lot of Americans who work hard at very low-paid jobs uh, you know, know that, uh, that hard work is not, um, not the whole story. Uh, the, the, uh, the truth is that um, uh, luck, inheritance, and circumstance matter enormously for who ends up at the top of the heap. And, and uh, if you try to do sort of statistical studies of who's going to end up rich and who's not, um, and you try to measure how hard people work, uh, you're not going to find that that explains very much of the difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, We're speaking with Isaac Martin, professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego, also the author of the book Rich People's Movements, Grassroots Campaigns to Untax the 1%. What is it that motivates the super wealthy to become politically active in preserving their position? Is it greed, fear, status seeking? Usually it's fear. Uh, You know, uh, greed... um Greed, although I think it's true that you know many very super wealthy people uh, are perhaps especially money motivated. Um, I don't think that explains why you would get politically involved because there there are a lot of easier ways to, if you're rich, to keep increasing your riches. Um, uh, but if you look at if you look at the history of this, uh, it, it's always these movements that get lots of rich people involved and agitating for um, uh, preserving their position. Uh, it's always in response to something they perceive as a threat from below, and and whether that's the New Deal, um, or whether that's you know big income tax increases that were needed to pay for the Second World War, um, or whether it's uh, whether it's fear of the Clinton health plan, um, but but uh, the fear that the position they have is threatened and that they might lose it in the future seems to be a very potent motivating force. Well, you know, you you bring up something historically when you talk about the New Deal, but you know. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had the boom that we had later on in years, right? I mean, so isn't is, isn't there a reason for them to perhaps embrace some of these things? To, wouldn't that perhaps actually increase their wealth or increase their status? You know, in the long run, it's certainly the the, the New Deal was absolutely essential in in the uh, sort of laying the groundwork for the post war economic boom and, and creating the kind of shared prosperity that American society enjoyed, uh, and uh, and. You know, certainly a lot of uh, very rich people benefited very greatly from that economic boom. So, if if you take the long view, and you uh, you know understand the 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 uh, interdependence of all of these macroeconomic um, you know forces, then I think it, it's quite clear that many of these rich people's movements are really self defeating. Uh, but um, but often they're motivated by very short term thinking in a very uh very immediate um and and often quite unfounded kind of kind of fear uh that that really um doesn't lead to that kind of long term uh long term perspective. Mm-hmm. Now you document that the rich people's movements borrowed heavily from movements of workers, farmers, veterans. What are some of those tactics? It's a it's a fascinating uh story here. So uh you know, some of the first rich people's movements, the, the so-called tax club movements of the 1920s, um, actually hired former organizers for the, the National Farmers Union. Um, and, uh, and you had hired organizers to, who were traveling the country, setting up dues-paying local chapters and engaging in exactly the kind of grassroots association building that we associate with, uh, with populism and with the community organizing tradition uh, in American history. Um, some later movements, uh, you know, there was a movement for income tax repeal in the 1950s and 1960s. And one of the, one of the tactics they used was actually, this is an explicit legacy of the veterans movement was to, um, do outreach through American Legion chapters and try to get, try to get American Legion, uh, chapters to sign on to, um, repealing income taxes on the rich. Um, one of the, one of the, the ones that's, also, maybe most surprising is the use of civil disobedience and 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 tax strikes, withholding taxes from the government. You know, this this uh, there's some surprising history in the 50s where uh, some uh, feminist supporters of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1940s and 1950s um, had learned the tactic of civil disobedience from their elders in the movement for women's suffrage, 
and uh, decided that they were going to use that tactic. A handful of very rich women decided they were going to use that tactic also to uh, push for repealing income taxes. Um, and some other of these sort of rich activists who were declining to pay taxes probably had in mind the model of the industrial strike also, and, and you know knew about strikes from their own uh, their own industries, and, and thought, well, you know, we could do that too. So there there are a lot of sources for these tactics that that are quite surprising, um, but but in every case, we see people basically learning and borrowing tactics from you know populist movements and movements of the left. Did the rich people's movement start with opposition to the federal income tax? It, uh, yes, I mean I think that, that the the uh, the federal income tax um, uh, and in particular the ratification of the Sixteenth Amendment to the Constitution, which permitted a permanent federal income tax in in, in 1913, uh, really set the stage for the rich people's movements to come. Although it wasn't until after the First World War, when when there was a big increase in federal income taxes uh, to pay for the war, that rich people's movements first really started to get organized and, and mobilized. Um, but it, it this does seem to begin in American history with the federal income tax, and and uh, and it seems to respond to changes in in the federal income tax. Okay. Isaac Martin, professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego, author of the book Rich People's Movements, Grassroots Campaigns to Untax the 1%, now available in paperback. Professor Isaac Martin, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. It was a real pleasure. And it was a pleasure having you with us. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. As we know, government ethics can be a very slippery concept. That's why we the people have insisted that every public official, from Congress creditors to dog catchers, swear to abide by some minimum standard of proper behavior. Not that all will honor it, but a code of ethics provides a measure of legal action against those who are grabbers and grifters. How bizarre, then, that the nine members of our august Supreme Court America's highest legal authority have discreetly refused to apply ethical rules to themselves, claiming that their group don't need no stinking code because, well, they are supreme. Chief Justice John Roberts himself assures us that each justice will always make the right ethical call because, quote, they are jurists of exceptional integrity and experience. Does he think we have sucker wrappers around our heads? Some of these black-robed honorables regularly engage in petty thievery, taking corporate-funded junkets to luxury resorts, getting free membership and exclusive golf clubs, and accepting assorted gifts from special interests. Clarence Thomas is the current king of handouts, taking thousands of dollars in freebies, including such pedestrian gimmies as car tires and cigars. Thomas, a 31-year lifer on the court, draws $230,000 a year from taxpayers. Can't he buy his own cigars? No one would buy stuff for him except to influence his decisions. Most damning, though, is the grand larceny of the court's six right-wing extremists who've turned what's meant to be a citadel of democracy into a Republican rubber stamp for plutocracy. They've stolen the integrity of the court itself, rigging their procedures and rulings to profit moneyed interests, suppress voting rights, hogtie workers, and generally run roughshod over the needs and democratic ideals of America's majority. This is Jim Hightower saying, to help stop this, go to fixthecourt.com. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. This social media is a 
social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. And we say hello to Erica Payne, founder and president of The Patriotic Millionaires. Recently, she is co-author with Morris Pearl of Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. Erica Payne, thanks very much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, it's our pleasure to have you with us. Now, tell me about your new book and your involvement with Patriotic Millionaires. Sure. Um, So the new book is called Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. Um, We wrote this book after working on tax policy for coming up on 11 years. In 2010, during the lame duck session of Congress, it became pretty clear that there were that. President Obama was going to cave to Republican demands to extend the Bush tax cuts. And that was really infuriating to a group of us. So um, I got a bunch of millionaires to sign a letter basically saying for the good of the country, raise our taxes. And um, the message really exploded in the media. The idea that a bunch of millionaires wanted to pay higher taxes was shocking to the media and to the public. And, um, And we've been working together ever since to try to correct the egregious wrong that is our tax code. Your book is a deep dive into how the current tax code is at the expense of working people. Tell us about that. Basically, seven, about 70% of Americans think the economy is rigged against them. And they are right. The economy is rigged against ordinary Americans. And then the question is, okay, how do you rig an economy? Well, the best first place to start to rig an economy is through the tax code. And what we have created within this country now is a tax code that virtually guarantees that we will become more unequal even more quickly over time. So right now, America is suffering from destabilizing historic levels of inequality. We're at the highest level of inequality we have been at in 100 years. And that inequality is the root cause of social unrest. Throughout history, when inequality gets to a certain level, you can almost predict Um, and guarantee that social unrest will follow. So anybody who looks around, whatever political persuasion persuasion you are, you can look around and say something has gone wrong in America. People are just not happy. They're not getting along with each other. Well, what is the underlying root cause of that? The root cause of that is a dynamic whereby a very small number of people are getting enormously rich and it's, they're getting enormously rich at the expense of everyone else. Well, and we're living in a time of great inequality in terms of both wealth and income. How does a tax code that favors the rich make that worse? We've created an economy where if you make money off of your money, you end the year richer than if you make money off of work. Let me give you a little more detail of that. So we, in the book, we, um, one of the core points in the book is the differentiation between how ordinary income that people get from a job is taxed as compared to how income from investments is taxed. And so we compare two couples, the work carts and the slumps. The work carts go to work all year long, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. Um, the slumps are already rich, so they hang out, drink strawberry daiquiris on the beach. Um, what happens when they make money? So the working people, say they make a hundred grand combined income. They go to their jobs, they come home, um, they get a paycheck. They make a hundred thousand dollars. After their standard deduction, 
they pay around nine thousand, a little less than nine thousand dollars in taxes. In contrast, the slumps who have been drinking strawberry daiquiris, sitting on the beach all day, playing golf, if they sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock that they own, so their income is also a hundred thousand dollars, but it's from the work of pushing a button on an E-Trade account, they will pay zero dollars in taxes on that money. So they made a capital gain. Capital gains are taxed at about half the rate of ordinary income. So here on one side, we have the work carts working hard, the slumps drinking strawberry daiquiris, playing golf. And even if those two couples make the exact same amount of money, one by working, one by selling off some stocks, the work carts end every year $9,000 poorer than the slumps. So that's the beginning of what basically our entire tax code is designed to do. It is designed to make sure that the rich get richer and everybody else is left holding the bag. And tax policy is so complicated that it's sort of, I think people feel like this is happening. They kind of generally know that this is happening, but they don't understand the specifics of it. So we wrote this book so ordinary people without accounting degrees could figure out what in the world has gone wrong in America. And one of the big things that has gone wrong is that we have been appeasing multimillionaires, billionaires, and corporations for decades. Um, and we have left middle class and working class Americans holding the bag for keeping this country running and it has to stop. We're speaking with Erica Payne, founder and president of the Patriotic Millionaires. Recently, she is co-author with Morris Pearl of Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. And Erica, it's not uncommon to hear rich people say they are job creators, so they deserve a tax break. But what's wrong with that argument? Well, the central thing that's wrong with the argument is that it's dumb and it's wrong and it's been proven to be wrong over and over and over again, and it doesn't stop them from using it. And it's one of the things that makes me the craziest about this whole conversation. Um, You know, the rich in this country basically set out this narrative that is, if you ask me to do anything reasonable, I will take all of my marbles and go home and you will be left destitute. The job creator argument is one of the ones that they lean into. On this, um, they, I'll give you some examples, right? Um, Randall Stevenson, who's the former CEO of AT&T, in 2017, when Republicans rewrote the entire federal tax code, Randall Stevenson ran all over the country insisting that the correlation between tax cuts for corporations and job creation was, quote, very, very tight. Well, during the time period from 2008 to 2015, AT&T's effective corporate tax rate was around 8%. That was well below the statutory rate at the time of 35%. So according to Mr. Stevenson's logic, during that period of time, you would have assumed that AT&T had hired a number of people given that 8% tax rate. Well, during that time, they laid off 40,000 people. During, after the tax cut was passed, after the millionaire tax cut was passed in 2017, um, and corporate corporations went from 35% to 21% while keeping all of the loopholes and shenanigans that they had had in there before, AT&T the following year laid off another 40,000 people. And so even these heads, these Titan heads of industry, you know, want to pay lower taxes and they don't care if they have to lie to the people in the country in order to do it. Randall Stevenson, bald face, lied to the American people when he said that tax cuts are a job creator. They are not a job creator. And they use that as an excuse to get out of their obligation for doing what they need to do for the country. The only job creator in the world is consumer demand. Okay, so even if you look at a company like Apple, Apple doesn't make money because of its investors. It makes money because people line up around the corner to buy iPhones and computers and every other kind of product. If you don't have those people standing in line, then you don't have any people who have to help those people find the right computer or iPhone for them. The consumers themselves are the job creators. And that makes it particularly perverse 
what we are doing and creating this level of inequality because we're essentially killing our customer base. When we take more and more money from the bottom and pile it on the top, we are limiting the fluid dollars that people will spend to generate job creation. And we're doing it in order to benefit a tiny number of people. And in the words of my friend, Ben Cohen, who's the co-founder of Ben and Jerry's, there's only so much chunky monkey one rich guy can eat. And what is the role of politics in all of this? I mean, on the one hand, we could understand how a fair taxes position could play across voting lines. But even if it did, would that be enough to counteract the interest of big donors who are funding campaigns? Um, I think that it largely is not, it has not proven to date to be enough. Taxing multimillionaires, billionaires, and corporations is wildly popular with the American public across party lines. The vast majority of Democrats and independents, as well as the majority of Republicans, believe rich people in this country should pay substantially higher taxes. The only people who disagree with that incredibly unremarkable notion are the lawmakers in charge and the people who fund their campaigns. Let me give you a case in point. David Koch, after the 2017 rewrite of the entire federal tax code, Paul Ryan, who was Speaker of the House at the time, was in charge of that. When the day, it was like the day or the week after that um, that tax rewrite passed, David Koch, the Koch brother, sent Paul Ryan five hundred thousand dollars to his leadership pack. They then pledged $20 million to go sell the American people on this crappy deal. They did it by running a job creators bus tour. So they're leaning into that branding. Um, The Koch brothers are estimated to have saved upward of $1.5 billion from that rewrite of the federal tax code. So they invest... $20 $20 million in a tour, $500,000 to the people who sold out America, sold out their fellow citizens, and handed the store to a rich billionaire. And that rich billionaire stands to benefit $1.5 billion. And if there was political will, what's on the top of your list to change the tax system? So there are a couple of things that we need to do immediately. One is we need to equalize ordinary income and capital gains Um, tax rates for any income over a million dollars. This is something I want to be clear to the patriotic millionaires focus only on taxing people with incomes of a million dollars or wealth of $5 million or more. We do, we actually disagree with the Biden administration who is saying that they will, um, that they are comfortable raising taxes on people over 400,000. We believe that number should be a million. Let's start with a million. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to equalize ordinary income and capital gains rates over a million dollars. There are then a series of loopholes that we need to address. There's a thing called the 1031 exchange, which basically allows rich real estate developers to build enormous portfolios of real estate assets, pass them onto their heirs and basically never pay a single thing in taxes. There's a loophole called the stepped up basis, which is one of the pieces that we may be able to get fixed in this um, upcoming tax reform um, debate that's happening in Washington. The stepped up basis is this thing where basically if you die and leave um, your assets to your heirs, any increase in the value is eliminated for tax purposes. And so basically you can pass on huge assets to your heirs tax-free. A couple of things that aren't likely to happen but need to happen over the long term are a very substantial wealth tax. Right now, the only people in the country who pay wealth taxes are people who own homes, um, and they only pay wealth taxes on those homes. Rich people may own multiple homes, but they hold most of their assets in other things like art, you know, antique coin collections, you know, privately held businesses, stock portfolios, things like that. So the only people currently paying a wealth tax are working people who own their home. Um, Billionaires don't typically pay much of a wealth tax because they keep their money in other places other than their home. And so the only people carrying that are working class people. And we need to change that. We need to institute a very substantial um, wealth tax. Um, 
there are a couple of other things that we talk about in the book, but those are some of the big chunks that we would really like to see achieved in this um, iteration. There's big debate happening in Washington about how to pay for uh, the kind of infrastructure we need to support the kind of country we want to have. We think 100% of that money should come from multimillionaires, billionaires, and corporations is to do it. Mm-hmm. And when we don't pay our fair share, does that undermine public faith in the whole tax system, even in government itself? Well, I mean, 100 percent. Listen, everybody can look around and see that Jeff Bezos is going into space and then he has the audacity and bad taste to thank the Amazon employees who work under extremely um, difficult circumstances Um, And he's basically sucking the money that they are making for him away from them and using it to buy himself a little rocket ship to go up to the moon. I mean, I just think the whole thing is, is, is gross, frankly. Um, And Jeff Bezos pays, you know, there is a ProPublica report that came out about the effective tax rate of most of these millionaires and billionaires. I mean, the vast majority of millionaires and billionaires pay nothing as a percentage of their income compared to what working people make. And in 2017, as I've said, the Republicans rewrote the entire federal tax code. In 2018, for the first time in American history, billionaires paid a lower effective tax rate than every other group of people in the country. Um, and, and so, I mean, you you look at people just getting away with murder. It's like any sort of um, any sort of social circumstance. If you see people getting special treatment, um, getting privileges that are not extended to other people, and these are people who have every amount of privilege already in the world, um, it just has to end. It's undermining the it's undermining the entire system, and you can see that again in all of the social unrest that's happening across the country. Absolutely. Erica Payne, founder and president of the Patriotic Millionaires, co-author with Morris Pearl of Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Erica, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time. We'd love to do it again soon. Um, Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. So it's important to recognize the Constitution for what it is. Yes, a great document. After all, it's guided us for over 240 years, but also a flawed document that's been improved over the years, but still needs a lot of work, especially when it comes to the rights of women and people of color, which is why I was so excited to hear about Ellie Mistal's new book, Allow Me to Retort. A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. You've probably seen Ellie as legal analyst on MSNBC. In his new book, he doesn't pull any punches about where the Constitution works and where it falls short. Ellie Mistal, thank you for joining us on the Bill Press Pod. It's good to connect with you. Thank you for having me. And uh, congratulations on your new book, uh, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. So uh, you kind of shook it up on The View a little while ago when um, uh, someone suggested maybe the Constitution is a sacred document. And you came back and said, uh, no, it's kind of like trash. (laughs) Were you just trying to shake things up or do you really mean that? Bill, I honestly was not trying to say anything controversial. That is that I didn't. I don't think that's a controversial <laughs> statement. Uh, look, the first line of my book is "Our Constitution is not good." The last line of my book is "Our Constitution." I'm here to tell you that the Constitution is trash. It's conservatives who tell you that it always has to be that way. So the literal frame of my argument is that this document that some people thinks were you know uh, uh, etched in stone by the finger of mm-hmm. God. 
um, is actually a, a fairly compromised and, and underwhelming um, compromised document that was scrawled out over a sweaty summer in Philadelphia. There's some good ideas in it. There's some bad ideas in it. The the ideals that it represents um, might might be you know uh, uh, quite high, and I might in, in, uh, agree with many of the ideals um, it professes. But we have not lived one single day in this country with all of the ideals you know contemplated in the mm-hmm. Constitution actually applied to all of the people living here equally. So structurally. I think it's kind of obvious that the Constitution has some, some issues, but in terms of what its uh, its actual effectiveness, it's also been quite, you know, again, kind of trash. You don't think we fixed it over the years, like with the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and, and others? Yeah. So let me tell you something about the amendment process, process right? Because uh-huh. it turns out that even, your, even a, a wonderful constitutional amendment means nothing in the face of conservatives – design uh, you know uh, uh, dedicated to stopping it now when i say conservatives to be clear i don't care what the conservatives are calling themselves this morning you know the mm. after the civil war the conservatives called themselves democrats right now they call themselves republicans in the futures they might call themselves you know wallers or, or i don't care what they call themselves who knows right the conservative party at every point has worked to frustrate the ideals of the constitution so when you take something like the 15th amendment yeah great amendment kind of fixes things what do conservatives do they stuck it in a drawer for a hundred years. They just ignored the Fifteenth Amendment. Acted like uh, just for your listeners, Fifteenth Amendment is the one that uh, grants the right to vote uh, regardless right. of race, color, or creed. Conservatives just ignored it for a hundred years. We have to have another kind of civil uprising that we call the Civil Rights Movement to get people to recognize the Fifteenth Amendment. It works. We have about forty years of kind of you know arc bending towards history elect a black president and conservatives got so pissed off about electing the black president that before his second term was over, conservatives had put the 15th amendment back in a drawer, which is what John Roberts did in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holden, right. by eviscerating the voting rights act. So yeah, have we fixed the constitution? I'd say no, because a document that was fixed would not be, it w- would not be so easily ignored every time there are five conservatives on the Supreme court. Uh, and of course, uh, efforts to restore that in the Congress, in this Congress, right, have gotten nowhere because of Republican slash conservative opposition to renewing the Voting Rights Act, not to mention adding the John Lewis Act. The 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 filibuster, right, yeah. um, is not in the Constitution. It's not a constitutional principle. That is something the Senate made up for themselves. Now, a good Constitution might explicitly deny um, Republicans the right to to block, uh, or sorry, the minority party the right to block popular le- legislation um, based on minority control. But our Constitution doesn't. Our Constitution decides to be silent about that. Our Constitution is silent about things like gerrymandering. Kind of important. Kind of important. But no, our Constitution doesn't have anything to say useful about, about gerrymandering. You know, another, sorry, another thing that I like to bring up is that the Constitution itself doesn't say anything about voting rights because the white slavers, white colonists, and white abolitionists who were no, no, uh, nonetheless willing to make deals with slavers and colonists, um, they didn't think that the right to ro- vote flowed down from the federal government. They thought the right to vote flowed up from mm-hmm. the individual states so that Georgia could have its own right to vote and New York could have its own right to vote and Virginia could have its own right to vote. And that's stupid. That's just dumb. That's not something that other industrialized Western democracies do. That's a, it's ridiculous that we are in 2022 and we have a federal election system that's actually 50 different state electoral systems as opposed to one overarching federal system. But that's what those people did back in the day. And again, that's one of the reasons why I say our Constitution is actually not a very good document. Uh, and of course, they don't want a national system, election system, right? Because they want states to be able, in effect, uh, to continue to Jim Crow. The states' rights argument has always been in this country the last bastion of defense of white supremacy. It is always where the white supremacists go. That We can go back to John C. Calhoun. We can go back, um, at, who's the Civil War era um, uh, uh, person who came up with the idea of secession. We can go back to Thomas Jefferson, slaver 
um, slavers all. States' rights is what the white supremacists use to justify um, their their ability um, to be racist. And let's let's not forget um, the states where most of the black people live in this country are still the states of the former Confederacy. Black people did not, you know, en masse move out of uh, the places where their ancestors were enslaved. So, like, if you, first of all, if you made D.C. a state, D.C. would be the state with the highest black population um, relative to overall population. But with that not in the in the mix, the next highest states of black population are Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. These are the, these are the states where, where black people live, right? Um, but which is why voter suppression is so critical in those states and why those states go so far out of their way to enact suppressive policies. Because if black people got to vote equally as white people on those states, um, um, the, the, the very red, if shall we say, to use a political term, term, the very red color of those states would get real purple real quick. So the subtitle of your book is A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. Then you add what rights we have, what rights Republicans are trying to take away. And here's the key phrase and how we stop them. How do we stop them? At, at the ballot box? So, so to you, to, to, I, I like to use a phrase from, from Remember the Titans, um, which is a, a Denzel Washington Disney movie about an integrated football team. Um, and there's a scene where, where the refs are trying to throw the game, trying to stop the integrated team from winning, and the white coach comes out, and he tells the refs, you guys are going to call the game fair, and then he gathers the team together, and he says, I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz every down. And that's what Democrats need to do. We need to blitz every down. We cede entirely too much intellectual legal ground to conservative arguments, which are bad, which are easily defeated if we would just fight for them. And so, you know, one of the criticisms I've seen on like Amazon or Goodreads about the book is that, well, you know, it's not going to change a lot of minds. Conservatives are not going to listen to it. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, I kind of I anticipated that the book is not for conservatives. Um, it's not it's not a, a guide to the Constitution for black guys. It is a black guy's guide to the Constitution. It is it is a rallying cry for liberals, for progressives to learn more about the law. That's why I have it written in, in plain English with no jargon, as little jargon as possible um, about some of these issues so that you can deploy these arguments against the conservatives in your life at the Thanksgiving table, on your Facebook feed, or if necessary, in Congress. Because one of the problems is that conservatives, every, you know, conservatives understand how important the courts are. They might not know much, but they, you know, they might not know much about civics, but they know that if they want their guns, they gotta, they gotta support uh, Republican nominees for the Supreme Court, right? If they don't like gay people, they know they got to support Republican nominees for the Supreme Court. Whereas liberals, you know, we we don't make the one to one connection between what liberals say they want and control of the courts. There's nothing that you want that can survive a conservative courts. You're not getting anything on gun rights. You're not getting anything on voting rights. You're not getting anything on police reform. You're not getting anything on climate change. Unless you control unless liberals control the courts. And my book kind of explains why. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.